I'd like to talk tonight about three kinds of mindfulness, which will then set us up uh, for the next talk that I give, the next time I'm here, to talk about the actual ultimate ground of being as potentially involving awareness underneath and encompassing those three kinds of mindfulness. Any kind of distinctions that we draw about states of being are inherently fuzzy. Somebody asked me, what's the difference between open awareness and being awareness? And I'll definitely get to that. But I just kind of want to walk through these three kinds of mindfulness. They're not better than each other. Uh, they have different pluses and minuses, different benefits. Uh, it's Interesting that sometimes focused attention, which is the first of the three that we explored tonight, is treated as almost a kind of a speed bump on the way into openness. And yet, so many of the um, progressive liberating experiences that the Buddha marked out in his roadmaps in early Buddhism involve deep focused attention, samadhi, concentration on a single object of attention with complete absorption in that into that object as a portal into liberating, liberating insight and states of consciousness. So the first of these is no small thing. But before I start talking about the three of these, I want to create a bit of a frame. Uh, I'm interested in not just what we do while we meditate, but what we do in everyday life. And meditation's great, I practice it, I teach it. And what do you do with the rest of your hours in your day, right? That's what really is of interest here. And uh, at any time, being able to establish a kind of fundamental stability of presence that is increasingly open and spacious and unconditional, being able to do that is good under any conditions. And it's especially good the weirder, the wackier, the wilder, and the scarier that the world gets around you at any scale. Uh, there's a proverb um, in the Buddha Dharma that says essentially, if one is carried away by a swollen, swiftly flowing river, how can one help anyone else? We need to establish a stability of presence, clarity of what we see, and a kind of collectedness, recollectedness, a gatheredness in ourselves so that we're not completely fragmented and blown from one side to another. Mindfulness is really, really important. It's foundational. It's not the only practice. We need to find heart. We also need to learn and grow from our experiences alongside knowing we also need loving and growing, two other major elements of practice. Loving, knowing, and growing is a simple way to remember them. And still, knowing, mindfulness, recollectedness, sustained presence of mind is certainly profoundly fundamental. Okay, so in teaching mindfulness, typically three kinds of things are taught. And someone who's written about this in a marvelous way, and I noted her book in the chat, is the mindfulness teacher, Diana Winston, who's associated with um, UCLA's Mindful Awareness Research Center. And Diana's a wonderful teacher, and her book is just a marvel of clarity, including in a very direct and simple way, she talks about things that can seem so fuzzy and nebulous, really in down-to-earth experience near sorts of ways. And she too talks about these three distinctions between focused attention, open awareness, and abiding as awareness, which she calls natural awareness, that I'm called, I'm calling being awareness or abiding as awareness. So focused attention, previously I've talked about different factors that actually can help us stabilize and steady our mind really important things. Establishing an intention, um, calming the body, you know, getting a sense of openness itself helps to stabilize attention. These are all really useful factors that can help you focus your attention. 
And somebody asked me in the chat, what do I do with really distracting other things, whether it's physical sensations of burning and itching, or let's say worries about the world. You know, how can I um, stabilize my attention when all these other things are happening? There's kind of a choice there. We can certainly shift attention over to that which is um, arising for us, maybe because it's what's calling to us, and it would be appropriate to give it attention. Other times, we realize, you know, that material is just going to be running. It's like having, you know, something painful in your body while deliberately focusing and refocusing again and again and again attention elsewhere. And as we do that, a lot of research shows that we tend to build up circuitry in our brain that supports um, deliberate, top-down, sometimes kind of muscular, willful exercise of attention. You really can get better at focusing attention, but there's no replacement for practicing, for trying to do it again and again and again, such as picking the sensations of breathing and saying, okay, I'm going to stay with the sensations of breathing continuously for four breaths in a row. Pretty good. All right, how about six breaths in a row? Kind of challenging. My experience, people tend to fatigue around the third to sixth breath. So if you can get to six breaths, you're doing really well. And then, all right, you're on a roll. Can you go all the way to 10? 10 breaths in a row. If you like, softly counting them up to 10 or down from 10 in the back of your mind. And then do it again and again and again. And see what you experience after just a few minutes of really focusing on the breath. You can pick something else if you want, a word, a mantra, a feeling, an image, just looking at a candle. But it's this fundamental process of resting attention on a particular object of attention. That's where you're establishing mindfulness. And by contrast, becoming aware of, wow, all the activity in the mind that wants to pull you away and drag you into focusing on something else, which is one of the great values in focusing your attention on a particular thing. Because by contrast, it reveals all the other seductions, all the other distractions, all the other noise uh, in your mind. Okay? Focusing attention. Open awareness involves a stability of presence which is supported by lightly staying in touch with, let's say, the feeling of breathing or an ongoing awareness of your body while you just sort of let the stream of consciousness run. When you're focusing attention, including in what's called shamatha practice or concentration or samadhi practices, you're, you're really going into it. You're really giving over to that particular thing and disengaging from everything else. So real focusing here and absorption in that particular object when you're meditating. Um, open awareness has this quality of you're, you're in touch, you know, you're grounded, you're present, but otherwise you just let the stream roll on by. And things that help you do that have to do with a kind of disenchantment with whatever is passing through awareness. You, you, it's, it's not that you're negative about it, but there's a kind of healthy meh. <laughs> the healthy meh. Like, okay, thought of work, eh, later. Fantasy about dinner tonight, whatever. Uh, little erotic image, whatever, anxious about something, let it go, uh, impulse to plan something, shh, let it wander on by, uh, sensation in your knees, eh, whatever, you know, but you're staying present. You're staying present, open, just letting it go. Sometimes this is called open monitoring rather than open awareness. Uh, it can be uh, accomplished sometimes by doing what's called a noting practice. 
I believe uh, the great teacher in Southeast Asia, Mahasi Sayadaw, really emphasized a kind of noting uh, where you know you bring a soft labeling to what you're experiencing. You're, you're monitoring, oh, sensation in the knee. Oh, thought of my daughter. Oh, fear about Ukraine. Oh, um, thinking that I'm superior. Oh, <laughs> thinking that I'm inferior. Oh, but you're not getting sucked into it. You're just monitoring. You're just noting. You're just labeling. Research shows, interestingly, that when people note, including you know, not so much when they're meditating, even just in everyday life, when they're just kind of noting what they feel, activity in the prefrontal cortex tends to increase because there's more of an executive function going on, as we note, with um, acceptance and objectively, not getting not, getting, not being critical of ourselves or getting all caught up in it, just kind of fair witnessing, neutral labeling. As that happens, activity in prefrontal regions increases and activity in that alarm bell of the brain, the amygdala, there are two of them technically, uh, tends to quiet down. So noting, monitoring, there's, there's, you know, there's just an, an acceptance and openness uh, of whatever's streaming through awareness. Okay. Then there's this very interesting and kind of hard to talk about um, transition into increasingly abiding as awareness. That naturally tends to happen as the contents streaming through awareness gradually fade, the quiet. They settle down. And there's a normal progression that the Buddha marked in one of his instructions that I listen, that I think about a lot because it's so practical, that we steady the mind internally, that's focused attention. We quiet it and bring it to singleness. Now in that singleness, there can be an absorption in a single thing, such as sensations or a feeling of compassion. Or in that singleness, the singleness can be a kind of unified singleness of awareness in which we are utterly present with very little mental activity. It's really quiet. You're aware. There is awareness. There's a little bit of commentary. There's a little bit of deliberateness to it. But mostly, there's not much going on besides awareness. You're aware. There, you know, is a little bit of awareness of you know, sensations in the background, uh, sounds around you, passing thoughts, but they become increasingly irrelevant, not interesting particularly, not important. You're just simply present. Several things can aid this. First, the sense of spaciousness. Spaciousness is useful in establishing open awareness because there's an openness, the spaciousness. And as we increasingly, as the content increasingly drops out and what's more and more apparent is simply the field of awareness itself, which in Tibetan Buddhism is marked sometimes as having qualities of luminosity or vastness unboundedness, openness. Yeah. Being mindful of the sense of spaciousness or opening wide, encompassing your body as a whole, including sounds as a whole, including everything as a whole, that, that sense of spaciousness, which is an attribute of the field of awareness, since it's utterly spacious, can represent anything coming through it. It's the field of awareness is also boundless. It lacks edges. So when you have a sense of the edgelessness 
of the field of awareness stretching in all directions, that tends to bring you into resting as awareness, this third kind of mindfulness. Now, all this may seem really exotic or esoteric. It's actually not. It's available to you. It's available. And as you train in the sense of being awareness, it really supports your resilience and your equanimity and the development of a kind of unshakable core of well-being. Because, you know, <laughs> thoughts and feelings come and go. All kinds of thoughts and feelings, good ones, bad ones, happy ones, sad ones, content comes and goes, you know. It's like the flotsam and jetsam floating down the river of the streaming of consciousness. Who knows? All kinds of stuff comes and goes. And yet, increasingly, what's reliable is not whatever is passing through awareness in the moment, but awareness itself as stable, available, never stained, never damaged by what it represents. And as you increasingly have this ability to bring it into everyday life with this sense of abiding as awareness, there's a kind of sparkle to it. You know, a kind of freshness, a vividness. Uh, you're both in the world, but not of the world. Kind of have the best of both of those. You're, you're aware, you're dealing with what's passing through awareness, but in a deep fundamental sense, you're not identified with it. You're not identified with what you see or what you hear, or what you think or what you feel. It's there. There might be something to deal with, but more and more, you have a sense of abiding in this, in this witnessing, in this being. That's awareness itself. A second thing, besides spaciousness, that supports this, this dropping down into, um, is what uh, I've really come to appreciate as kind of a newbie in that territory, but the Zen teaching around just sitting from Soto Zen, one of Dogen, great Dogen uh, teacher, um, just sitting, Shikantaza, where interestingly, you're not trying to gain anything. It's, it's the not doing that is the doing. It's the not accomplishing that's the great accomplishment. You're just sitting with no gaining mind. And if you have a mind like mine, which is very purposeful and tends to accomplish this or understand that or get get there or plan that, um, it's quite something to really explore giving yourself a break, you know, for the duration of the meditation or whatever else you're doing in your life so that you're, you're just being. You don't have to accomplish anything for the period. <laughs> what a relief. You're just being, you know, just sitting, just breathing, just walking, just lying down, just standing, just being, you know, just reaching for the water, just um, talking into a camera. You're, you're just being. And when you're in that attitude of just being, the machinery of craving that's very biological tends to quiet because there's not a sense of anything missing or wrong. There's a sense of enoughness in the present when you're just sitting, just breathing, just being. So you're not driving one way or another. You're not grasping this or pushing away that or clinging to another person. You're not doing any of that. You're not active in that way. It all just falls away, falls away. And as that falls away, supported by the sense of just, of, um, just sitting, not doing anything, uh, more and more you're not identified with any movement toward or away from or against or any process of self-referencing. You're content already. You're receiving the arising without seeking becoming. Receiving arising, receiving appearing, releasing becoming, releasing becoming continuously. And you can get the feeling of that. And something that supports the, the sense of this 
is if you can find a soft sense of contentment. You know, we're, we're, we're animals. We're not designed to sustain a sense of simply being awareness. You know, there's a lot of machinery around drivenness of one kind or another. So if you help yourself with this feeling of a kind of soft contentment, you know, establishing yourself in that sense of soft contentment in the present, like it's okay in the present, it's good enough in the present, establishing there, then once you're established in that, you can let go of any effort to establish yourself there. And as that falls away more and more, you're just being, no problem, just being. Aware, content. Around the edges of this certainly can be pain in the body, can be worry about others. This is not a spiritual bypass. This is not about avoiding anything. Um, it's only with a lot of practice that we can sustain this sense uh, over time. But during training, during meditation, or even if you can, just in everyday life, seeing if you can find five or 10 minutes to see what it's like to just kind of sit quietly, maybe with a cup of tea, maybe with your cat in your lap, gently stroking your cat, and you just right there, See if you can rest in this felt sense of it's okay in the present, the eternal present actually. It's okay, content. Simply being and getting more and more a sense of yourself as a field of awareness through which various experiences pass. Unidentified with any particular experience. That's the third kind of mindfulness in which there's almost nothing else present besides mindfulness itself and a soft underlying feeling of sufficient well-being that enables you to rest in the present. Okay. Speaking of my own experience with this stuff, and I'll wrap up in a minute and open it up for discussion. <clears throat> For a long time, I, I read about resting as awareness, being awareness, Diana Winston's natural awareness. It made no sense to me. I, I couldn't get a feeling for it. I, I read the words. They were in, in English, you know, <laughs> in my native tongue, such as it is. But like, what? And yet over time, especially as you kind of develop a meditative practice, you start to mark these transitions where you're initially focused on something kind of to help your mind stabilize. Okay. And then you start relaxing that somewhat muscular effort that's top-down and deliberate, focused on a thing, and you're more just kind of open. There's still a lot of content, it's a lot of experiences passing through the open field. And then increasingly, as the content starts to subside, the volume starts dialing down in your mind, there's less and less streaming along, what becomes more and more apparent is the river itself, or kind of more exactly, uh, a kind of field or space in which experiences occur. And you start resting more and more as that field, as that space. Uh, Tara Brock and Jack Cornfield call it loving awareness. You, you might be aware of a kind of uh, lovingness in it. Uh, for me, it's been very helpful to you know, have these sort of blended sense of abiding as presence with qualities of contentment and warm-heartedness in the mix, kind of blended in like a really nice little spice in your soup. Uh, 
increasingly, increasingly with practice, you really can find yourself here. And as you find yourself here, wow, it's really valuable. Really, really valuable. You know, as a teacher, I think about the Buddha's instruction to offer teachings that are good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end. And he said his own teaching was good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end. And and I, I try to offer a, a range uh, that's good for people who are at the beginning, also good for people who are kind of in the middle of practice, and useful for people who are really kind of stretching into the, the deeper end of the pool, including with what it's like to abide as awareness, to rest simply in being. And I hope that's been useful for you here. All right, so I'm gonna take a peek at the sidebar. Many things have come up and I won't be able to speak to all the questions or comments. Uh, please know I really do read the sidebar, which comes in the chat is what I mean, uh, very carefully and I really appreciate it. Uh, so even if I don't respond to you, you can know that I've received you in this way. All right, so let's see. One thing I wanna say that came in to me as a, a direct, as a private comment from someone, so I won't use the name, uh, the person basically uh, says, I've had multiple traumas in my life, and I've also read David Trelevin and others. David, wonderful teacher, maybe we'll get him as a guest teacher sometime, talks about trauma-informed mindfulness practice. And it is true that too much meditation, particularly under certain conditions, can lead to a spiritual emergency or lead to a, a, a surgence, a resurgence of trauma material that can be really overwhelming for people, how to balance this. And then the person continues, I'm trying to do shorter meditations, but it's hard to resist the longer ones you provide, Rick, as they are so meaningful. So thank you for that. So there's a fair amount of material uh, initially championed by the really fine researcher and, and being Willoughby Britton at Brown University about risks of mindfulness. Very briefly, those risks are mainly relevant for people who are particularly vulnerable to a traumatic, overwhelming material arising or who have a fairly uh, dissociative, not well glued together personality structure. Um, and when people who have that kind of vulnerability or who are prone to manic episodes, people who have these vulnerabilities then go on retreat and are isolated or do very intensive meditative practice on their own, there can be bad results. So if you're vulnerable in this way, um, in particular, be, car be careful, be careful. And if it starts to feel too intense or kind of destabilizing and wobbly, back off, stop meditating, disengage or do shorter periods, or reestablish meditations on uh, very kind of wholesome factors, like the felt sense of connection with others, or a feeling of your basic all rightness in the present. Kind of strengthen those so that then, as you do more openness practices of the sort that I was teaching tonight, even if difficult material arises, it won't be so invasive, and it won't be so capable of carrying you away. That's, that's an appropriate kind of thing. And be thoughtful. If you go on a meditation retreat, let the teachers there know that, you know that you've got this background and you want to be careful about it. I think it's true that risks for, for some people are very real. They're a very small fraction of the people who have a everyday mindfulness practice. And uh, I think it's important to not overgeneralize from risks for some to everybody else. Uh, more generally, I think uh, the advice really is keep feeling into what's helpful for you. If you're starting to do something that just doesn't feel good for you, disengage. Um, there are people who have had longstanding injuries to their back from, let's say, doing certain kinds of retreats in which they were told to sit perfectly still for you know, hours at a time. Not good. You know, listen to your own tuition. But I think if you generally listen to your own intuition and you also develop supportive factors like feeling cared about by others, taking in the good, noticing you're all right right now, stabilizing a kind of 
felt sense of your own centeredness and groundedness and strength, then you can go further and further into the deep end of the pool. Okay. So let's just see here. Any key questions? Aha, uh -huh. great. What's someone, J Jacqueline Reed at 655, great question, so fundamental. Dr. Hansen, what for you is the purpose of meditation? Great question. Um, I think of meditation as having multiple purposes depending on the meditation we use. One purpose is to just chill out. That's a legitimate purpose. If you plop on the couch and stop stressing about this or that, that and just let your mind wander and you kind of calm down and settle down and you get up 10 minutes later or 20 minutes later, you feel sort of cleansed, kind of refreshed. That's good. That's okay. <laughs> that's not an advanced practice, but that's a legitimate practice. Second kind of purpose is training attention. Meditation is the preeminent training of attention, uh, partly because it's easy to sustain t attention to something that's really interesting, but a repetitive kind of sensation like the feeling of breathing or uh, just kind of being here without doing anything, without checking your phone or watching you know, any screens, that is a higher bar and requires more attentional control to be able to do it. So meditation is a wonderful training of attention. Third potential benefit, meditation is a real opportunity to get to know yourself. Now that might be a little scary sometimes. So, you know, I think there's a saying in Alcoholics Anonymous, the mind is a dangerous neighborhood, never go in alone. So we wanna feel like we're bringing our guides, our allies, our resources with us when we go into the mind. But as you meditate, you get to know yourself. Things that have been pushed away with everyday activity or, or you know, internal defenses in a psychological sense start to bubble up, start to bubble up. And some of that is painful maybe. Some of that are things that you might feel remorseful about or ashamed of, um, regrets or unfulfilled longings. You get to know that. You also get to know good qualities, you know, positive, beneficial qualities in yourself and you get to appreciate them. And you can also, through meditative practice, bring a quality of acceptance and even warm-hearted compassion to the things you're getting to know inside yourself. So you get to know yourself better. If, and that gives you more of a sense of being at home, being at home with yourself. Um, undivided, not at war with yourself, including all of yourself even the parts that you need to regulate in various ways. So that's another one. Another one is that meditation, especially as you refine it, can be a very powerful laser-like beam into your own mind and can give you deep insight, vipassana, both into the dynamics of your mind, the psychodynamics, uh, such as Freud talked about, you know, and the factors that lead to more or less suffering. And also meditation profoundly can give you insight into the nature of the mind, the nature of experiences as made of parts that are connected and changing so that they are empty of absolute solidity, absolute self-existence, absolute identity. And that recognition, which may seem kind of abstract at first, becomes incredibly freeing as you start realizing, wow, all experiences are empty of solidity. They exist emptily. And because there's a foamy insubstantiality to them, an ownerlessness to them, an impersonality to the rising and passing away, ooh, grasping starts to fade away trying to thingify your consciousness fades away and you're much more able to abide in the present without craving and without the suffering and harm that causes. So yeah, deep insight. Um, and then maybe I'll summarize my list here in response to the question, what's the purpose of meditating? Which is really the, more broadly, what's the purpose of contemplative practice altogether? Is that as we meditate, we, 
can get this feeling that really deepens over time of coming home to our true nature, of coming home to an underlying wakefulness and good-heartedness and ease that's inherent in the deepest levels of our being. We kind of increasingly abide there at a level that's deeper than personality, deeper than gender, deeper than personal history. And that sense of that ground, that ground, that true nature, way down deep, your fundamental nature, can feel like it extends into something vast and impersonal and transpersonal. So that's another major benefit of meditation. Any one of those, I think, is reason enough, and all of them, pretty good value. Okay, so I'm going to open it up to see if people have questions or comments. I'm going to particularly prioritize people who haven't spoken before. So I'm going to start with you, Nancy Langley, and I'm going to ask you to unmute. I see your hand raised. I'm asking you to unmute. Uh, as usual, you may have heard my request. Uh, please be succinct and speak to what we're talking about tonight. You know, Rick, the experience you talked about, about um, uh, living in awareness. I was on a retreat and had a direct experience of what you're talking about. I called it my experience of being Teflon. Mm. Nothing stuck. It lasted for a few hours. That question of who are you? Who are you? I used to puzzle that. And that out of that experience, then I knew who I was. I was awareness. That's who we all are. It was the most ecstatic experience of my life, but it lasted for a few hours and then yeah. it faded away. Yeah. And even though I've been in many other retreats, I hear and understand what you're talking about. I have directly experienced what you're talking about, but I've never had that experience again. It was divine, uh, yeah. but it just... I understand it, but it just, I never directly experienced it again, I guess. So that's a statement. And I guess yeah. the question is, you gotten any hidden tricks to have that <laughs> direct experience again? Because I, I know that I was grasping yeah. for it. Yeah. I know that. And after a number of years, a number of retreats, I kind of let it go. But hearing you again, talk about what I experienced and knowing that place uh anyway if you've got any oh yeah advice about well, that well um to begin with i'm happy for you and i think <laughs> you know i'm glad for you it's Thank yeah you. and really there's something just sacred and beautiful in that uh i'll say this that what you've described is the kind of experience that many people have had, which doesn't diminish its profundity for the person who's having it. Yeah, and uh, there are scientific papers that you can look up. Uh, I'll, David Yaden, Y-A-D-E-N, if it's of any interest to anyone, is a researcher uh, at Penn. He may have moved on elsewhere. Wonderful guy. We interviewed him, I think, for the Being Well podcast early on. And he's written about what are called self-transcendent experiences that have these two fundamental aspects. The sense of personal self, ego, falls away. And the sense of everything shines forth in radiant perfection, including often, as you've said, a sense that of, of awareness or other transpersonal things, especially awareness or maybe a universal love too, are the condition of everything fundamentally. They are the nature of everything fundamentally, right? So classic experience. Uh, I've written about it with some detail in the chapter in my book, Neurodharma, on opening into allness. And you might take a look at that. There's references to other things, neurodharma in the chapter, opening into allness, um, which is the sixth practice of seven of awakening. So what to do? Really deep question. Uh, it seems that some people have these experiences once in their life and they just never have them again. 
That's really quite common. You might want to also read Henry Shuckman. Henry is a guest teacher here, and he's written his gem of a book, uh, One Blade of Grass. He talks about several experiences of this sort he's had himself. Uh, my own view of it is that, consistent with what I think many other people have said, on the one hand, there's tremendous value in these experiences. On the other hand, they're not always available to people. You can't make them happen. Yes, sometimes we can foster them maybe with psychedelic assisted therapies. People are working on that. You know, I don't know it's you know, maybe what's available down that road. But meanwhile, we can keep putting pinholes in the veils of the infinite. We can keep having experience by experience, insight by insight, a gradual um, turning. I feel like we, you know, we exist in a shroud that blocks us from seeing what's always already true, the light that's always already there of awareness, of lovingness, vastness, timelessness, the absolute, the unconditioned, as the Buddha put it. And we can either have the, the shroud popped open, doors of perception, Aldous Huxley bursting wide, great. And for a lot of us, it's much more of a matter of putting one pinhole after another in that shroud, one inside, one moment of awakening, many moments a day, again and again and again. And then gradually over time, that shroud becomes gauzy, becomes open, and we feel increasingly permeable to the ground of all, the truth of all. And we have an increasingly clear background sense of it operating even as we function in everyday life. And I think, you know, Nancy, that's what's available to all of us. You know, you had an insight into what our true home is, the ultimate home, unborn and undying, right? The home, the fundamental home. I I bless you for it. I'm glad for you. And, uh, bit by bit, even in ordinary consciousness. So I have faith in this because I'm a plugger and a plotter, (laughs) not a plotter. I try not to plot anything, but plotting along. I'm with Sam, you know, helping Frodo in his journey, steady as you go, one step in front of another, one pinhole at a time, right? We can gradually abide, huh, increasingly rested without the fireworks, without the dramatic radicalness of it, but still we can abide in the felt sense of, you know, the true home of all of us. Always been, always will be, never going anywhere, even as we busily bop around. So I'm so glad you brought this up. And I do feel that these practices that I'm talking in this classic progression that you see laid out in the Buddhist tradition, you see other similar kind of related progressions laid out in different traditions, including those of the native people, the indigenous people, Uh, around the world, uh, that as you steady the mind, quiet it, bring in the dimension of heart, and come to a sense of singleness, increasingly you, you abide as true nature, here and now, even as you, uh, you know, put ketchup on your french fries. (laughs) Thank you so much, Rick. Yeah, keep on going. Yeah. Like, what draws you into the ultimate, you know? Like, different people, it could be Nancy for you. It's a lot about heart, you know, as your heart opens and dissolves. I think love is the ultimate practice because it, it's what dissolves edges and boundaries, and, and we feel lived by love. And, you know, other people, some, for them, sometimes it's insight practices. You know, liberating insight, radical clarity, really helpful. Other people, it's paths of service, karma yoga, you know, where they just open and they, they give and they, they release self in that process or combinations of it all. Um, yeah. For me, uh, a loving openness into everything has, you know, been pretty important. Yeah. Well, thanks. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, we're coming to a wrap. I know um, 
Let's see. David and Jed, I've spoken with you before, so sorry. I'm going to prioritize Katie Wolf here in terms of asking her to unmute. And David and Jed, I know both of you know how to reach me. Uh, just send me an email if you want related to um, your question or comment, okay? Or use the contact form on my website, and I'll definitely reply to you. All right, Katie, going to bring us home here, wrapping us up here. Okay. Um, um, I just want to say that I've, I've done open awareness practices in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, and I wanted to share a, a line that really Thank sticks you. with me, um, what they say, which is that um, in the end, or ultimately what happens is awareness comes to prefer itself. Wow. That's really beautiful and interesting. Rather than the objects floating through, the flotsam and jetsam. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah. Wow. Did you want to say any more about that? or? Um, I just wanted to share that because that right. really kind of sums it all up in terms of, you know, the, the final stage there where you yeah. become one with the awareness, you know. Uh, yeah. 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 So, so I just wanted to share that. And then I wanted to uh, ask a question if I could okay, and just and, and also express gratitude I, I've been involved with your classes for several years and you have helped me so much and mm -hmm. I um I I listened uh today to that talk about steadying the mind and the five things to do and the first one being intention and that's my question is that um I don't, I don't know if I'm like weak in the area of intention. I, I also work with trying to wake up in my dreams, lucid dreaming. And uh -huh. one, one of the practices is I, I want to remember my dreams. I will remember my dreams. Again, this intention, Yeah. but it doesn't work very often. And it's kind of true in my waking life too, with setting the intention to steadying my mind. And I've been at this for a long time. So I'm just kind of like, do I just like give up trying so hard and just accept sometimes I do, sometimes I don't, or is there a way to like strengthen my intention? Well, if I follow you, um, and I'll be a little brief here, you, you might already have pretty, have really strong intention. It's just that uh, the capabilities need to be developed further over time. And so I think of in, intention as both top down and bottom up. You may have heard me talk about that, and I think that where the where the you know the most powerful is bottom up. There's a place for top down, great, but bottom up, yeah, and it's kind of like giving over to it. So uh, when I think about the the bits that I know about Tibetan Buddhist practice, and I'll kind of finish on this. Do you is have you practiced with, and is it useful to you to have a feeling of giving yourself over to goodness? I'll just call it that. Giving yourself over to the deity, you know, figure, giving yourself over to um, the ground of all, if you're really dropping into a kind of Dzogchen style practice. It's the giving over to, um, which can have qualities of Devotion, bhakti yoga, I think there's a place for that, but that's still kind of dualistic if you think of it. You know, the devotee of that over there, devoted to that over there. You know, I, I love that over there, which is distinct from giving over to that as me carrying, carry, as that which carries me along. That's a way of intending. Do you, have you played around with that? Have you explored that? No, but it reminds me of what you said in one of your talks about being devoted to the breath during yeah. the time of your practice. You know, it's like, yeah, I could I could do that. I can do that. Not not being devoted to the breath, but de be devoted to the energy of the deity. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and given over to it. There's this dimension to it of selflessness, of releasing. And it, I think it can help also, as I finish here, to have a kind of embodied sense of okay versions of that surrender. You know, they like giving yourself over. To, I think of, I guess, of a current of a warm river. I'm giving myself over to the river. That literally, you could, you could feel like I'm doing it in my body. You know, kind of like Gumby, like you know, <laughs> carry it along. And and to make because it's scary to surrender, to give up control. If we're talking about there, giving up there, ego. Yeah. There you go. There you yeah. go. Yeah. But to find it's the good, like, like uh, you said, being willing to surrender. Yeah. 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 Being real. To, it's okay to feel good. Yeah. 
Yeah, and that's, I think, wrapping up here, um, to give over to being, to like trust in being, you know, trust in awareness, trust in love. Uh, you know, the, um, you know, Stephen Snyder, wonderful teacher, we'll have him as a guest teacher soon, has done a version of the Third Zen Patriarch's beautiful teaching that begins, the great way is easy for one with no preferences. Right? And Stephen's version of it is trust in awakening. Kind of goes to what Nancy was talking about. Trust in wakefulness, trust in awakening, trust in the stream moving through, fall back into it and let it be that which carries us along. Mm, thank you. That's beautiful. I got it. The body well, thing. Thank you. All right. So wrapping it up officially, taking a breath, that might be a really nice way to end it here, to ask you really, what do you trust in? What do you trust in? And can you trust in awareness? And can you trust in your own inherent nature, your own inherent good nature, deep down, no matter what, and let it carry you along? I hope you enjoyed that talk. I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free.